boom, here we are. Another episode, Stories of Gumption Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, really having a lot of fun here, having a lot of great conversations. Really appreciate your support. Uh, we got another really good one for you today. Another really good one for you, near and dear to my heart, uh, literally. Uh, but we'll get to today's guests in a couple minutes here. Uh, let's talk about our awesome sponsors. We've got three of them, and they all have been supporting this podcast uh, in, a, in a great way, and we really support that, or we really appreciate that, and uh, can't thank them enough. The first one, Kavanaugh Realty. Galen Trombley and his team are doing great things for this community. They're a local independent real estate company helping their neighbors buy and sell their homes. Check them out on the web or social media, hashtag local matters. And if you listen to the Galen Trombley episode, he talks about where the hashtag local matters comes from, but essentially it's an initiative to keep your money local. They are, as I said, an independent real estate company. And uh, their, their money is local, they're independently owned, they're locally owned, and uh, your support of Kavanaugh Realty is support for local. Uh, check them out. They've got great social media, great social media and they got great uh, YouTube page. Uh, give them a shout. Give them a shout out. Check them out. I like them a lot. They're good people. Enough about Kavanaugh Realty. Open Gate Farmstead, sponsor number two. They have been here since the beginning. Uh, dedicated supporters and continuous supporters of the Stories of Gumption podcast. As you've heard, if you've heard any other episodes, they are a stone's throw away from the mighty Osable River. Open Gate Farmstead is a first-generation farm specializing in free-range poultry, pasture-raised pork, and seasonal produce. I've actually seen some photos recently on their social media of their seasonal produce this summer, 2019, and uh, it's looking like the start of something really phenomenal. Their slogan is, happy animals make the healthiest and tastiest product. Check them out on YouTube. they got a great story going. Open Gate Farmstead. They're also on Facebook and Instagram. Third sponsor. Thanks for sticking with us here. This is... Uh, a newer couple, actually, that own this company uh, that I just met, and they're phenomenal people. Phenomenal people. You want to talk about class acts that really do business well. Uh, if you have any cleaning solution needs, residential or commercial, check out Sparkle Clean. S P A R K I L K L E E N. Sparkle Clean. They provide professional and economic cleaning solutions to residential and commercial structures. They specialize in window cleaning, floor care, carpet extraction, and auto and boat detailing. Give them a call for a free estimate. They're at 518-578-2931. That's 518-578-2931. Find them on Facebook as well. They're also on Instagram. And that's Zach and Kate Hoyt. Great people. Check them out, and we really appreciate their support of the Stories of Gumption podcast. Today, woo, like I said in the beginning, near and dear to my heart, literally. It's my better half uh, is our guest today. And for those of you who have met her, you know she has gumption. And you're probably wondering why she hasn't been on the podcast sooner. Those of you who don't know her, you're in for a treat. I'm going to do my best to stay neutral throughout the interview and talk to uh, my significant other, uh, as I do with all the other guests, and, and really pull out her awesome story of gumption. So here it is. Enjoy episode number 19 of the podcast. Gumption, defined as initiative, aggressiveness, resourcefulness, courage, spunk, guts, common sense, Shrewdness. Welcome to the podcast. This is Stories of Gumption with your host, Ryan Lee. Okay, so 
today's guest, certainly near and dear to my heart, as I mentioned in the beginning before the sponsors, uh, it's my better half. Lauren Gagne, by popular demand of a lot of our friends and family asking to hear Lauren's story of gumption and full transparency, Lauren is the executive producer of this podcast. Here's a little bit about Lauren Gagne, her background. She's an academic coach at SUNY Plattsburgh. Phenomenal at her job. Uh, she's also the formal former captain of the SUNY Plattsburgh women's soccer team. She is a PFC soccer coach, PFC standing for Plattsburgh Football Club, and she's been doing that since 2011. She's also a published author. She has two chapters published under her name in uh, some professional literature, so that's pretty impressive. Welcome to the podcast, Lauren Gagne. Wow, thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. You do live here. That's true. <laughs> on, your, on your podcast, you know. <laughs> yeah. I've the, listened to it. The full... the full. Uh, but on the other side of the mic, that's very cool. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And and like I said, yeah, by popular demand, I, uh, I, uh, I'm I dumb for not having you and your story of gumption on here sooner because you certainly have a lot of gumption. And uh, I'm just going to cut right to it because I'm curious. I know the listeners are curious. What is your definition of gumption? Hmm. Well, I guess the way I see gumption is giving your 100% best, giving your absolute best regardless of the circumstances. And your best might not be saving the world, being Superman, absolutely crushing it your best could be just getting out of bed for that day but your best it's all it's all relative to you but for me gumption is give putting your best foot forward regardless of whatever's coming at you Mm, that's a good that's a good way to look at it because the my best is certainly not our neighbor's best or my colleague's best or a friend's best, but like everybody has their unique strengths, weaknesses. And if you just give your best, that seems like that's pretty gumptious to me. Yeah. Cause you, you have no idea what someone else is going through and, um, something you might see as mundane or, or easy, might be very difficult for them that day and it's very gumptious for them to be doing something as you see as routine so you know it could be it could be heroic or it could be you know everyday things and I think everyone's got their own they just have to be honest with themselves um what that level is Mm. how do you assess what that level is for yourself well I'm super competitive so I'm it could be everyday routine things. Um, and I'm competing with myself. Um, you know, from a very young age, I was always thinking, okay, there's someone who's, you know, a little bit better than me that's putting, you know, a little bit more effort. I need to compete with that and try to put a little bit more in. Um, so it could be, you know, making sure I'm eating the right things it could be making sure that i'm getting the right exercise i'm studying that i'm working it could be on in any facet of life and um so that's that's where my competition goes it's it's more against myself than anyone else Hmm. you should you should play more golf (laughs) golf is the ultimate compete against yourself for sure yep and i ran track and that was I mean, it's all you. You can't blame it on anyone else. If you suck, it, that's all you. Right. You can't say, oh, well, so-and-so. I mean, uh, maybe a relay race, but still, you're, you know, times don't lie. Right. Right. So, I mean, you're you're throwing out examples of athletics mm-hmm. right off the bat. Yep. So, from a competitive sense and you... Uh, demonstrating some gumption in your life would you say athletics is one of the main facets to your life where you've where you feel you may have 
demonstrated some gumption? Oh, absolutely. I was very competitive from a very young age. Um, and I loved sports. I love being outside. I love just the team aspect of being with other people and competing and just being active. Um, you know, so I played soccer, basketball, uh, volleyball, track. It, I mean, even like tic-tac-toe on the bus or arm wrestling or it could have been anything. Um, and I made it into a game. So I... I really love sports as a kid and growing up and I played, you know, college soccer um, and now I'm coaching. So it's it's a really cool avenue to get that competitive side out. Do you have an idea where that came from in your in your upbringing? Like, you, you know, you didn't you didn't play soccer uh, when you were a year old, I assume. So like at some point you'd you transition into your first sport did you have it before then did it click when you started playing sports for the very first time did it click did it click a few years into sports I started playing soccer when I was like four or five years old Um, I also did gymnastics around the same time um, and basketball and I remember my mom made me end up choosing um, between the three and really just picking something that I wanted to stick with. Um, And I felt so guilty telling my basketball coach that I was going to stick with soccer um, because I had promised that I would, you know, come back the next year and play basketball. Um, But I I really loved it. I fell in love with soccer. Um, But I think I was, I think I was always competitive. Um, You know, if I go way back, when I was very, very young, I think just in terms of shaping my own philosophy on life and how I see things. Um, when I was very, very young, I had surgery um, on my ureters and I never liked doctors or hospitals or blood or any of that stuff. And I kind of had like a, you know, a routine surgery and I was in and out of, of the doctor. But I guess being terrified of blood needles and doctors I kind of had this philosophy of you never know how long you're gonna live so you might as well give 110 percent um and so I think that kind of translated into sports as well like if you know you might as well give it your all because you have no idea how long you have left and you know luckily for me I didn't have anything life-threatening at all Um, but I think just, you know, the scare of being very young and being in a doctor's office and, um, you know, going through that experience kind of instilled it in me pretty Mm. young. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Because I mean, I was pretty sick as a little kid, but it was more like toddler. I don't remember it. It's, it's really fascinating that you remember it and, uh, Yeah, I mean, I had surgery when I was like, I don't know, a year or two years old. And then, like, I had um, UTIs all the time. Um, And so I I vividly remember going to the doctor and, like, having to go through all that stuff and um, get tested. And I just remember I just didn't like it. I mean, I'd lie to my mom and she, if I was, um, you know, sick... I'd always have a fever and um, so I'd go into my mom's room late at night and be like mom I'm thirsty and because I was terrified I didn't want to go get water by myself in the dark and so I'd be like mom I'm thirsty can you get me some water freaking monsters (laughs) the monsters are gonna get me (laughs) and my mom would feel my forehead and she'd be like oh yeah you are sick you've got a temperature I'm like no mom you don't understand like I just need water I don't I don't need to go to the doctor I'm not sick just get me some water and um she knew right away every time it was like clockwork that was kind of the joke um if I said I was thirsty it meant I was sick It reminds me of the time you and I, I think we were still dating, but you had to get the TB test for college. Yep. 
And you were like, Ryan, can you go with me? I, I absolutely hate the doctor's office. <laughs> and I was like, the well, needles. yeah, no, nobody likes the doctor's office, but I mean, it's not that bad. And you're like, no, no, I think I have to get a vaccine or something. And I was like, okay, well, you know, the, I kept thinking to myself at the time, like not truly really understanding the background of why you hate doctors and just at taking it at face value in that moment going, okay, we all cried when we got our first shot when we were a toddler, but like, come on, Laura, you can do this. Let's, let's go. Come on. It's not that bad. And over time, I actually have learned this background. It's like a, I don't know if you'd call it a phobia, but like. It's a phobia though. I res- thoroughly respect and understand, like we have to have doctors and nurses and I res- respect the work that they do, but it still doesn't negate the anxiety I have, you know, going to, a hospital or the doctor's office and my whole family works in a hospital but I still get anxiety even just walking in even if I know I don't have to go there for my own you know diagnosis or whatever um even if I'm just seeing my mom yeah I've got this anxiety walking in um and I think that I've just had that since I was I was little well you know there's they say there's a lot of you know everybody has their thing but there's very profound impacts on stressful experiences for the rest of your life when you're single digit age. And yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, um, and so. I always thought I'd be, you know, working in a hospital or something, but I think that fear just kind of overtook all of that. So it's, it's interesting. And I'm a fainter too. So if I get shot or if I get blood drawn, Oh, I am out like a light gone. Yes, we know. but so you know i think it's good that you shared that because i think that's a profound piece to your definition of gumption doing your best so i'm trying to put myself in your shoes and i'm thinking yeah if i truly was impacted at a very young age by this this series of experiences that wow i'm i'm not fully healthy like i i don't know what life has in store for me uh i better give this sucker my all that makes a lot of sense to me yeah i mean and i don't want to paint a picture like i you know had cancer or anything but no 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 not to and not to downplay anything like that but but i think it's also we can't downplay the fact that you were what four no, you, you said you had surgery at one, but like if you're super young and you remember this, I feel like the impact of that at a very young age has got to be profound. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's funny. I remember being in like first grade and I remember I I peed my pants and being so embarrassed by it and my mom having that conversation with Oh, how it, you know, is it related to my YouTube UTIs and how it's connected to my health and blah, blah, blah. And I so did not want it to be a part of that because that for me meant more testing. Um, but, you know, coupled with that embarrassment. So, you know, it's it kind of carried on, trickled into when I was in elementary school. And but luckily, you know, everything was good and. So I was able to to move on from it. So yeah. So you 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 develop this competitiveness at an early age, and you start translating it towards soccer and basketball and these things that you just started. And then you fell in love with soccer the most. You you mentioned mom. Oh yeah, for sure. Pa- Paula Paula Gagne, Mama G had to made you choose, and you chose soccer. My mom was my gymnastics coach too. Yep. What? You yeah. said no to your own gymnastics coach? I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, boy. But Poor. all my friends, they they played soccer, and it was just, I don't know. It, there was no competition there. I just, mm. I really enjoyed it, and it was competitive. And my dad told me, he was like, when you score your first goal, I'll get you a pair of soccer cleats. So, you know, that added fuel to my fire to try to score a goal and then i was able to Mm. you know get a real pair of soccer cleats and felt like a real soccer player so i feel like knowing you and being part of 
your fantastic, wonderful family. I've gotten to know both your parents really well, and I, I feel like I feel like I'd love to ask you about that. Sure. Like your parents and what they each did for you in building this gumptious competitiveness. Mm-hmm. Well, they were both pretty integral in there, I would say. Um, my dad was always the person that was stoking the fire, and I think he knew how competitive I was and still am because it's still in the present. My dad still stokes my competitiveness for sure. Give me an example. Um, You're a grown adult. He's still stoking the fire. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, it could be with related to school, um, related to work, and it's you know you do something that you think is really good and it's you know it's not necessarily he gives you the good job where you know he's proud of you but it's the so what are you going to do next <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't let you revel in it too long <laughs> um so for me always pushing um where where I'm going to go and not just you know basking in the glory of whatever I did Mm. um you know i if in soccer i scored two goals he'd be like well how come you didn't score four because you know you hit the post and you missed this <laughs> you know that could <laughs> that could have been more and <laughs> in, in reality you're like dad i scored two goals isn't that awesome <laughs> so you know he was he had that balance of supportive yet still stoking that competitive fire mm. of what are you gonna do next and on the other hand my mom I mean, regardless, she she had that super supportive, making sure that, you know, whatever I needed, um, she she was there. And if even if I needed to vent and just kind of, I guess, work things out in my own head, logistically, she was kind of a sounding board and she just gave awesome advice. Um, so they had a very good balance between the two mm. of you know, stoking the fire, but also providing that logistical support of what to do when things get tough and giving me the tools to make sure that I was supported. So between the two, you've got this nice balance of support and stoking the fire and all that are, there is in between and your own personal mindset of I got to make the most of what I have and uh, doing my best mm -hmm. fitting in with your definition of gumption perfectly. So tell me about the period of time from, let's say, JV varsity soccer through graduation of college. Tell me how you approached life and this philosophy of making the most what you have um well i was pretty i was pretty dedicated um and had this this mind of mindset of acting as if there was someone that was a little bit more talented than me and also putting a little bit more effort in and trying to see if i could match that so you know if at night i'd see a how many push-ups, how many sit-ups I could do that day, um, squats, making sure that I was fit and doing everything that I could. It could even be like having a soccer ball and just, you know, taking as many shots as I could or dribbling around the yard or um, getting some speed dribbling in or sprints in. Um, so I think I was just making sure that I was racing against myself um, to try to, I guess, make myself better. Um, so yeah. And I, I ran track and I tried playing volleyball, which was completely new to me. Um, which I had a lot of fun with that, that kind of helped me relax and take some of the pressure off. Cause it was just, it was just fun and new. So. Yeah. And, and you had this, uh, will inside you that like, when things got hard or I was tired or what, or I was bored of doing the same drill over and over, you were just like, no, I got to keep doing it. Well, I had this will, but I also had routines, which 
I think looking back, I had a little bit of OCD in the sense that I, I had some rituals that I had mm, to do. Okay. okay. Um, it, and it stemmed from like everyday attacks. So it was like measuring out my steps and counting my steps and counting, you know, how many bites it took to eat something or making sure I walked through a doorway correctly or making sure I ate something. And I tried really hard. I don't want anyone to know that I had this because I knew it was really bizarre, really weird. And like, I don't, I didn't even tell my parents about it. Um, but I think I definitely had these routines, these rituals, um, which kind of echoed a little bit of OCD. Um, it took me two hours to get ready in the morning. Holy smokes. Just, get out of here. Just going through my routines. And it was like, you know, counting my steps, making sure I went through things the right way. And if I didn't, I had to do it over and over and over again. Um, <laughs> and it yeah. translated into God. to soccer too. And, you know, if, if I had to hit this exact spot, uh, you know, so many times and, you know, if I hit it 10 times and if at the ninth time I missed, then I had to redo it and do it 10 more times exactly the way I, you know, perceived it to be or needed it to be. Um, so it was very interesting looking back how tied I was to that. Um, but I think ultimately it ended up helping me because it helped me to really focus on what I needed to do, though I focused on a lot of things that were not important. Um, looking back, you know, who really cares how many steps it takes for you to get from, you know, your bedroom all the way down to the kitchen, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Or I remember, I remember I would say goodnight to my sister <laughs> over and over and over again until it felt like it came out of my mouth the right way. And Linz would just be like, all right, like, <laughs> I'm done. I'm over it. Um, but it was just, you know, I don't know. It was the way it was then. It was hard to change. Wow. Did it did you did it translate into things beyond sports? Yeah, I mean, talking about the the rituals, so you know, saying goodnight to my sister, um, to making peanut butter and jelly the re in the morning and you know, how much I peanut butter to jelly ratio I had to counting the steps to how I entered a doorway to um, how many plies of toilet paper I had, like <laughs> just these really bizarre, I mean, from, from my perspective now looking at it, you know, it seems kind of arbitrary. Why does that matter? Um, but, you know, I think, you know, they say it's a way to kind of find control in a situation and yep. you know, it yep. could have just been, you know, my middle school years and trying to find some control in that. But, you know, I, I had an amazing childhood. My parents were awesome. I couldn't have asked for anything better. Um, so I think ultimately it ended up really helping me cause it helped me focus on, you know, my sports and very pretty much dial into, what I was looking to get better at. That's awesome. I feel like I remember uh, when we first met, uh, we were both in high school band together. Yes, we were. Did you ever get a little uh, competitive in band? Yeah. I mean... <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I always... I remember being like four or five years old and I wanted to play the flute more than anything. I was so excited and um i remember being a kid and um my mom had all my birthday presents all wrapped up and i remember sneaking into her closet and seeing them all wrapped up and uh there was something that i thought was a flute and i got so excited and i opened it up and it was an umbrella <laughs> and looking back like you wouldn't you wouldn't wrap a flute all put together like it'd be in a, a case but who you know. bought somebody an umbrella for Christmas. No, it was a birthday. It was a birthday. Oh, I'll edit that out. My mom got it for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my my mom got me a, a umbrella for, for my birthday. But I, you know, I always wanted to play the flute. 
I played in, you know, fourth and fifth grade band and middle school, high school. I really, really loved it. Um, and I just, I dedicated my time to it. So it ended up doing really well. Um, I think I, I went pretty, pretty far for being in high school. You know, I didn't take it up in college. I, I kind of gave it up, but I definitely miss it. And I, I really, really enjoyed it. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I certainly enjoyed band too, but it's, it's interesting your experience versus mine. I feel like I was almost kind of the hell raiser that enjoyed music, but enjoyed the camaraderie of band. You were the hell raiser. Equally or more so than than actually playing the instrument. You were the goofball in the back and I was business in the front. Right. Like a, right. That exactly. You, you understood that, that dynamic. Business in the front party in the back. Business in the front party in the back. I was in the back row with a bunch of other hooligans playing trumpet. And that's where all the, "Quote unquote cool kids," at least as we thought at the time, were sitting. But um, we're all cool. We're all cool, man. We're all cool. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, good times in band. I do. You, since we're talking about band and all that, I feel like it brings up a good memory for me that that would be fun to share. Do you remember where we first met? <laughs> you and I met on a band trip. A band trip. Yep. How romantic. <laughs> we were in Cleveland, Ohio, and we were just having fun. Yeah. Okay, you tell me your memory of this story. Okay. Well, I remember we went to a water park, and I kind of get a little blurry in terms of... But I think the water park was the first time I really had a conversation with you, um, and you were with some of your friends, and... I ended up just kind of on my own looking for some people to go on the water slide with. And you were super open, like, hey, come down with us. And we had an awesome conversation, awesome time, and we had lots of fun. And, um, you know, I didn't really think much of it at the time other than that you were super sweet and accommodating. I mean, I was a lot younger than you, I guess, in relation. We're only, like... Easy now. <laughs> You're old, I'm young, you know. No, 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 no. You take that back right now. But I was in ninth grade at the time, and you were in 11th grade, I think. Yep, that's true. So, you know, I was a freshman in high school. I didn't really know many people. Um, Band was, you know, four grades of people. So I was the bottom of the totem pole, and, you know, it was pretty cool. You welcomed me in, and so we we went for a ride. And then I remember... Uh, going on a cruise ship and you had some fun with some napkins that's and i remember your dad being a goofball that's that's pretty much what i remember oh my gosh i forgot about the napkin story that's freaking gold that's gold but yes i remember uh i remember the water park i remember being with a good friend of mine jeff stitt and another good friend of mine uh nick trombley i believe just riding around on the slides and i remember i think this... adam lucia was there too oh yeah it might have been adam lucia when i first saw you on Boy. the sli- slide <laughs> i think it was you and adam maybe what a good dude what a good crew oh yeah the red man group crew <laughs> a story for another another day if you're curious about that story a little cross-pollination of podcasts here uh you got to listen to episode one of craig cast I talk about that, but anyhow, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I remember. I remember this young girl coming up, and I was like, "Oh, hey!" And, and it looked like Jeff and, and the other guys knew you, but I didn't really know you. And they're like, "Yeah, you wanna, you wanna go down the slides with us?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, let's do that." And it was love at first sight. <laughs> Not quite. You were dating somebody else at the time, but you know, it's just. I was to say that. I was staggered <laughs> on at that point on the trip, but yeah. yeah. Um, we, it, you know, I think where we really came to come together was when, you know, we were in band one day and you just opened up and you just gave me a big ass hug. Yeah. <laughs> um, we digress a little bit. But anyhow, so um, 
where was I? Where was I going with all that? So you, so you, um, you decide to go to Plattsburgh State. SUNY Plattsburgh, yes. I can't help but think part of that decision was your competitiveness and your love for soccer. Well, for sure. Um, so I had every intention of going to the University of Vermont because um, that's where my dad worked and I could have gotten free tuition going there just because he, he worked there. Um, but my senior year, I got a call from Karen Waterbury, um, who was the women's soccer coach at the time. And she asked if I had thought about playing at the college level and if I was interested in going to Plattsburgh. And so I ended up talking about it with my parents and kind of weighing my options. And I decided that, you know, I would, I would go to SUNY Plattsburgh so I could have that opportunity of playing on the women's soccer team. Wow. And what kind of lessons did you learn from there? Like you already had this this crazy competitive side, but it almost seems like your competitive side from there was was very individualized. Like you said earlier in the podcast, um, trying to beat yourself. Well, I think it's interesting. At the college level, everyone is fast. Everyone knows how to pass. Everyone has the basics down. Versus in high school, it's a little bit easier to kind of, you know, stand out. Um, so it was it was really tough in the beginning, um, you know, going through tryouts and going through the process. And, you know, you're you're not playing all of the games all of the time. Um, you know, you go you go from high school playing every second to oh my gosh, all right, I'm coming from the bench and I'm going on. Here here we go. I got to give it my best shot. So that was a very interesting and humbling and awesome experience. It pushed me. Um, and it, it was really cool. Hmm. It seems like you would have to learn not to get discouraged. And even though things weren't always going the way you hoped, maybe, learning not to quit yeah yeah you have to you just got to keep pushing um and you know i guess what you were talking about before also um i was always about doing my best and giving my 100 percent um you know if we won a game but i still you know i missed a shot or i could have done something better i was kind of down on myself because I knew I could have or should have changed the game for the better um and sometimes vice versa you know if we lost but if I scored you know it was all right like at least I I kind of got my rhythm going and I just got to keep that momentum um so but I think watching my evolution over those four years was pretty cool and plus and beyond um, and, you know, I'd attribute some of that to you in terms of focusing more on the community versus the individual. And I think hmm. growing up, I was very much focused on that individual um, and improving myself and trying to get better um, versus realizing that we are a team. And, you know, I've got some some talents and dedication, but not everyone is in that position. Um, And how do I use that to bring other people up? And I think you've kind of instilled me, instilled that in me um, at a pretty young age, which was, I think, very beneficial. And it's, you know, translating into my role beyond just being a college student. Mm. I feel like I remember a time, too, where it's like a classic just. (laughs) <laughs> Lauren Gagne being competitive moment, but you told a story about going for a run with your roommate or your best friend. And like just the, the, I feel like this story speaks to the true uh, competitiveness and give it your best mantra that you're yeah, talking about. It's, it's so funny. Almost um, to a fault. <laughs> my, for sure. My, my college roommate, Emily Lone, um, we 
we decide, you know, to go for a quote unquote easy and short run together. Um, we'd say, all right, let's just go for a two mile slow run and it turn into a six mile sprint. <laughs> and, you know, it would start off as, you know, one person's shoulder is, you know, a few inches forward than the other person's. And so the other person starts going a little faster and vice versa. And then pretty soon you're sprinting and neither person feels comfortable saying, ah, I I don't feel comfortable at this speed because we're both so competitive <laughs> and wanting to win. And so, you know, we went six miles and we were cruising. We were not going at a slow pace. Um, and finally we got to this point where, and I don't remember who said to who it was like, all right, I'm going to go this way. You go that way. And we just had to separate because we just needed to catch our <laughs> breath, but neither person felt comfortable saying, can we slow down a little bit and just go at a regular speed? Have you two ever talked about that? For sure. We, we we got back to our room and one of our friends was like, I just saw you two sprinting on down Ruger Street. What was going on? And it was we neither of us in that moment felt comfortable saying, let's slow down. And so we reflected on it afterwards. And that's when we felt comfortable once we were done. But when we were in that moment, even though we knew we weren't competing, um, you know, I could make anything a competition. <laughs> Seriously. It, it could be eating. It could be anything. Like, pick up a piece of paper and let's see who can toss this the closest to another object. It's <laughs> so freaking true. It doesn't matter. But when you apply that to your life, and, and now as a professional woman in the workplace, I feel like that translates into this... Uh, this this you know daily effort of i'm going to give what i can i'm going to do my best in my role and i feel like that's a amazing lesson for a lot of people to listen to yeah and i think where i've grown is i've learned to not sweat the small stuff or the stuff that quote unquote doesn't matter um you know in terms of appearance, for instance, or, um, you know, making sure I like when I was in high school, I'd wear makeup and make sure my hair was straightened and all this stuff. Well, in 10 years from now, who really cares if your hair was straightened or not? <laughs> no one really cares. Um, but what people do care is about how they feel when you have interactions with them. Um, and so I guess looking at today, for me, it's more so of what positive interactions did I have with people? Did I um, leave something better than, you know, it was before? And still pushing to try to make sure that I'm giving my absolute best, but I'm learning to let go of the quote-unquote smaller stuff. Mm. And I think you've helped me kind of re relax on that because mm. um, I was – very type a very much a perfectionist and everything had to be um a certain way i can remember if you didn't get a hundred or a four oh well i'd cry your whole world imploded <laughs> yeah whole I would world be very, imploded i would and be very I, upset I, I, classic i was the classic guy who got like a 93 overall gpa oh yeah and, you were the worst kind of and, kid and like you I did, put in you effort. Just, you just coasted, though. I, I freaking Let's be real. coasted. I freaking coasted, but I also didn't want or desire. I didn't have that competitive edge, and I don't know what's better. I feel like you're better off because you learned competitiveness early. Because when you showed up for freshman year of college, you had that mindset of, doesn't matter how hard this is. I'm getting a freaking or you know GD. 4-0 on every class and for me i went into the same mindset that i had in, co in high school and it was like oh yeah i'll just coast and i think there's a balance and that's what i still i don't think i learned that when i was in college because i was 
I was working for the grade and I wanted the 4-0 and I wanted the perfect score versus learning for this is the profession I want to go into and I'm learning to make myself better versus learning to earn the perfect grade. Mm. And I think I, that's just how I was. And I think I'm still, I still am to a, a greatest extent, though I've let some of that go. Um, but it's it's interesting watching yourself evolve and seeing the things that you would sweat more about. And I'd be curious if I went back into school, how focused I would, because I think I'd still be wanting the 4-0, but trying to be mindful and trying to balance um, that those two things. Because I don't think they're necessarily one and the same. Mm. And this, this whole conversation has been building towards this um this this question that i have uh and it's you know you you've been so competitive it's driven you to do what you do to be successful in what you do to be a college athlete to get four o's and and do all these amazing things can a competitive mindset like that be taught it's a good question and a tough question. Um, you know, I've I've coached for the last several years and you're trying to instill this competitive competitiveness in these young girls. Um, I started with a group with, from when they were U8, so like seven, eight years old, and bringing them up to U18. Wow. And, um, you know, I... I think you can foster competitiveness and you can provoke it. Um, and there are things that you can do to kind of help instill it. Um, but you can't make someone, you know, want to spend all this time honing in their craft. If they don't have that intrinsic value, <laughs> it's only going to go so far. Um, you can set up situations that help provoke it and foster it. Um, but if someone doesn't want it for themselves, you can't do it for them. Mm. And that it, it's exactly like what you talked about earlier in the podcast, like almost the OCD of, I am not going inside for dinner until I make this shot at that exact spot the way I want it 10 times in a row. Yep. Yep. You got to have that in you. You just got to... Trying to instill that discipline in that drive, you know. Um, I had friends that we would be cutthroat and we would just go after each other and we would give it a million percent. And then, you know, the same drill with two very different people that didn't really care about it it would have very different outcomes. It'd be like, all right, you got it, whatever. <laughs> mm. I'm not going to work my tail off to win it back. Interesting. So I think, you know, you can kind of put that seed in, but if, if people don't want to do it, what I've learned is you can't, you can't make them do it. And sometimes that's what parents are trying to live vicariously through their kids and trying to make them do something that they don't want to do. It almost raises an interesting question of like, where's the line between giving your, giving 110% like that extra, like shit, I really want to go inside, but I need to do this over again because I'm honing my craft versus crossing the line to, um, I'm not giving my best. And I guess what I'm trying to say, I, I'm not articulating this the way I want to, but like, you what's mean to, like running a marathon? What's to say? And and not not sure if you want to complete it or not. Oh damn! You just you just put me on the spot. What I was <laughs> going to say is sort of this a, a question around the theme of what you said in the beginning of the podcast. Gumption is doing your best. Well, what is someone's best? Think, right? Versus versus 
what is your best versus what is slacking versus what is giving 110 percent and like you know are, are those two people that you reference that didn't have the same intensity were they giving their best or were they just not giving 110 percent it's a good question and i think I think the only person who can answer that question is the individual who's doing it. I can't tell you you're not giving your your best because I don't know what's going on inside your head. Though I can say a lot of it is mental and that a lot of times we think that we're at our capacity and that we can't give any more, though our bodies are still going through and survival mode is very, very strong. And our bodies are a lot stronger than we think sometimes. Um, So I think only the individual can decide what their best is. Because I think society is very good at trying to tell other people whether they're doing their best. Oh, so-and-so is being lazy or so-and-so is slacking. Um, But I think you also have to be honest with yourself. Um, Is there more that I can be doing um in this moment but also people have to protect their mental health and you know if i push myself past this line am i gonna be able to take care of my kids or you know be able to put food on the table so some people can't give a hundred percent for everything that they're doing based on their circumstances um they have to conserve some energy left to be able to take care of the necessities and things that they have to do Um, but for me in my life and the way I've lived it, it's, you know, can I give my best in every situation that I'm giving? Um, Hmm. I love it. I can't, uh, move on without addressing a statement you made about a full marathon. Oh, shots fired. I hit a nerve. Shots fired. And those who have listened to the Stories of Gunshin podcast uh, earlier on, you probably heard, uh, I don't know, episodes probably at least six through 12 or 14 or 15. I I went on a period of just talking with the guests about running. It fascinates me because I suck at running. You don't suck at it, though. I do. It's not natural, and it's it's... Maybe it's just um, I've finally found my match, maybe. Like the one thing that is just so unnaturally difficult for me that I think it's all relative. I've continued to fight to get better at it. And like when you say give your best, so we ran a half, you know, here we are in uh, it's. You know, early June 2019, we just ran a half marathon in Alexandria Bay. And you crushed it. Crushed it. Thank you. Personal record. That was pretty awesome. What was your time? Do you want to share? It was like an hour and 51 minutes. Yeah, that's pretty good because uh, it was a big loop. and It was pretty hilly. The first mile through mile four was a freaking roller coaster. Literally. It was just rolling hills. Up, down, up, down, up, down. And then you get out past mile four, and then it's a nice flat loop all the way back to mile eight, nine. And then you got freaking four more miles of up, down, up, down. And (laughs) I was, my personal best is under two hours uh, by, you know, two, three minutes or so. And I thought I was going to do that again. And those hills killed me. But the fact is that you PR'd with those hills. And I don't know what the difference is. Like, a PR is a PR, right? So, like, we both had to run those hills. We both had a goal. And we both had different records, personally. You beat yours. I just finished. You know, two hours and... Was it three minutes or something? But I guess I guess uh, I'm I'm taking a pretty big digression here. But it's an interesting point of discussion because 
it's about what like again what is your best and um how do you make sure you're doing your best well i think i mean running i think is a good metaphor for life cuz life gives you hills no matter what you're going through um and for me in terms of running you got to you got to just focus and just get up that hill and i almost you know try to stride up it cuz i know the top's coming up quicker versus if i just walk up it um and we were talking after how you were saying you'd hit the hill and you just you would end up walking to the top well i'd i'd find a point in my head and i'd say all right i'm not walking until uh, you know i hit that hit this point you know which is almost to the peak and all right i've hit this peak can i go a little bit further um and just keep striding as long as i can um and if i have to walk i have to walk but at the end of the day i'm going to be a lot better if i just keep on striving so i think there it's a big mental game Mm. because i think your body can do a lot more than it's letting on a lot of times and you know so you definitely have to listen to your body and whatever it tells you but for me i know i can push my body a lot further um and so when it's getting hard all right can i just focus on a point and get there and it's a big like i love going back to amy kretzer's episode because she talks a lot about the internal versus external locus of control in psychology and uh you clearly have an internal locus of control to the nth degree. Like you are all about like, I want to do this and I want to do it for me and I am motivated to do it. And that's why you ran your first marathon last year. And, um, I I think it's cool. (laughs) Like, yeah, that'd be cool. Like, yeah, I, I totally think about all the people I could tell you. Yeah. I did a full marathon. That's not a good enough reason by itself. Well, I think it's something that I wanted and something that, you know, I could I could work towards and something that I valued. It's hard to put a lot of effort and work into something that you don't necessarily value. Um, and I think with you, you know, I really like... Uh, it's weird to say I like running because I don't think it's... We have a run uh, a love hate relationship um <laughs> you know, i love the way i feel after i run but it's always a oh, i guess i gotta go work out type of thing um but i think with you i think you you've seen my evolution with running and how i've done and um you, you kind of being pushed by that but i don't think it's something you've woken up and saying and said, I just want to run a marathon. And that's exactly what happened with me. I, I woke up one day and I literally said, I'm going to run a marathon. And that day I found a five month plan and I signed up for a marathon. That was five months from then. And I stuck with my plan and I finished it. Um, but that's because it's something that I wanted to do. If it would have been a day before, no one could have told me that I was going to run a marathon and I wasn't going to stick to it. It had to be something that I wanted and something that I wanted to see through. Mm. That's a great example of, of that listeners in general can, can take to heart. Hopefully if there's something that you wake up tomorrow and you say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go back to school. It's going to take two years. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go and I'm going to apply for that job because I want it. I'm going to go pursue that dream because I want it. I'm going to go run a marathon because I want it. I feel like there's a lot of different applications to your story and your gumption in that moment. And I think, you know, you have kind of a background list of of goals, a bucket list things you'd like to do. And for me, you know, running a marathon was on that bucket list though I think I was scared to put it on there because I didn't want to not do it (laughs) and quote unquote fail Um, but I saw running as an opportunity um, to relieve stress to 
focus on my health and to get better. And so I got to a point where I I just kind of need that. Um, and so I think if if you have goals that you think, wow, this might be a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, what are the steps you need to do? I mean, I have on my whiteboard at work a goal without a plan is just a wish. And so we say all the time, I'd love to do this, I'd love to do that, but unless you have a plan, it's hard to actually do it and make it achievable. Um, so whatever you want to do, can you develop small steps? So I know today, all I have to do is just run a mile. I don't have to run 26, but it starts with that one. It's so true. It's so true. And, and I mean, when we start training for a half or you're training for a full marathon, the schedule does start with two miles. Sounds crazy. Like you'd think there's this set standard of like, oh, I need to be able to go out and run 12 miles tomorrow. No, not necessarily. You need to be in a certain level of physical fitness for that goal. But yeah. It's like going to the gym. People say all the time, if I need to go to the gym, I need to be in shape. You don't need to be in shape to go to the gym. But people feel insecure that they need to be able to fit in to be able to do a certain thing. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about what you do as an academic coach at SUNY Plattsburgh, because I get a lot of questions of that in the community. And I'm sure a lot of people who are listeners, whether they're in Northern New York or several States away or whatever, whoever's listening, uh, we didn't really touch on that yet. So tell people what your role is and how you kind of fell in love with it. Sure. Um, so I have a caseload of students that I work with um, and I am their academic coach and I help them could be with advising, um, academic coaching. So with time management, it could be, you know, they're having relationship issues. They're having roommate issues. Um, there are certain things that are getting in the way of, um, them doing their best in terms of getting their degree. Um, and so I meet with them on a regular basis and help with whatever they need. I think a lot of students don't have that roadmap for college success. Um, There's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of um, things that end up being roadblocks to college students. And I'm that person can, that can help advocate on their behalf and help them navigate the college system. That's fantastic. And you're certainly, you come home with amazing stories and, and I'm sure we could dedicate an entire podcast to that. I'm going to pivot to the stories of gumption rapid fire section. All right. Here we go. What's a billboard that you would put up? If you had, if you could have a billboard anywhere in the world and put anything you want on it, what would you put on that billboard? Hmm. Well, I guess sticking with this theme, since it's already in my head, um, a quote that my college roommate had and alone on her wall um, when we were in college was, and I can't remember who said it, but the quote was something along the lines of, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. And I think that really highlights for me, um, just kind of giving it your all, whatever, whatever you're doing. Um, and I, I had that even when I was in high school and learning, you know, tryouts and preseason and when things get really tough, um, and you're competing against all these other people and it seems like everyone else has it together, but they really don't. Um, and a lot of times you just got to outlast the pack so to speak um and so you just whatever you're doing you just gotta leave it all on the field give it your give it your best um and that's all relative to you and you have to decide that for yourself um and do a little less judging of other people whether they're they're doing your best but i think we are all given something um, and we just gotta, we gotta put it all out there. I love that. I'd say that's the theme of this podcast for sure. 
And there's definitely gumption to that. Um, if you could add one last meal, it's, it's the end, right? And you get one meal. You can pick anything on earth. What would it be? Mm, I think I'd combine my two favorite things. So I love dessert. <laughs> love dessert and chocolate. Of course you do. But I also love berries. Ooh. So I would combine, if I could take a Toll House pie. Oh, damn. That sounds amazing. And put berries and cream on top of that so I could have both. Oh, my gosh. I would be in heaven. Who is your favorite teacher and why are they your favorite teacher? Wow. This is a tough question. Um, Man, you're making me pick pick somebody. Uh, all right. Well, I, I guess... know you have many amazing mentors and many amazing teachers in your life. So for any of those who are listening, this isn't personal. It's just, this is just, you're just picking one. What and why? Well, you said the word teacher, so I won't go to the word professor and that'll make it a little bit easier. How about that? Um, just because you and I met in band, I'll go with Mr. Nestoriak and... Um, he's without him, we wouldn't have met each other on a band trip. So, and we had him, you know, in middle school and high school and he was just an amazing mentor and that guy class act. Yeah. Class act looking out. So yeah, that's, that's what I would pick. Awesome. Last question. The infamous uh, board of directors question for stories of gumption podcast you ready here it comes let's do it if we could put together a three-person board of directors for lauren gagne to guide and mentor her through the rest of her life who would they be they can be alive deceased famous or not and why would you pick them all right well i think i'm pretty practical um, and I would pick my mom and my dad for the reasons I said earlier, my dad pushing me and always getting me to look for the next chapter, um, and look for the next thing. And my mom, cause she's super supportive and provides that sounding board and helps me figure out things logistically, or even if I just need to vent or, you know, whatnot. So those two together are an awesome pair, and I am so lucky to still have them in my life. Um, they're they're pretty sweet. They're pretty sweet. And the last one would be you. Oh. Um, you push me in a very different way. Um, you know, you still keep me competitive and thinking about things, but... You are so community oriented and looking at the bigger picture um, versus just myself. And I think having you as a mentor, but also my partner in life is is awesome. So well, I'm I'll, I'll, pretty I'll, lucky. I'll be on your board of directors any day. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, this has been great. Awesome, awesome podcast episode by Popular Demand. Having my better half on the Stories of Gumption podcast, Lauren okay. Gagne. Do you uh, want to have a sending message to all the listeners? I guess I would say that life is short. And you really don't know how much you got left. And um, so why not? Why not give it all you got? Because you you really have no idea. Um, and you can make such a big impact on someone else's life if, you know, it could just be helping them out. And for you, it might not be that much, um, but it could make the world to, to somebody else. So, yeah, just just give it all you got. I love it. Mm.